Hi there, you guys. Welcome back to the channel. I'm really excited for this video because a lot of you guys in my um, group class have been asking me about um, the color mixing and which colors, I guess because there's been so many watercolor sales, which colors are better and worse to choose. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because there is no like perfect color, right? There are colors that you are going to love and colors that maybe you're not going to love as much. And there are going to be colors that will just blow your mind and that you will always want to use and you will never want to give up. And I think as we go through this series, and I've done quite a few um, so far on color and color mixing on this channel, but as you go through this series, you'll find that there are so many colors to choose from, right? So if you have the wood box set from uh, Schmika, which I have, it's a 48 wood box set, and I'll link it below in the video, you get like all of these beautiful colors and lots and lots of single pigments, right? But when you go to choose colors and work them into um, a painting, you need to know what they're going to do when they mix together and which colors to choose. And I think that's where a lot of people, especially newbies, as you're coming in, you don't have the experience with your favorite colors yet. You haven't picked colors yet. You think you like certain colors, but then when you work with them, they might be difficult <laughs> to say the least. So that's what this color series is going to help you with. Now go back and look at videos like this where I did a full explanation of all the different blues and things like that. But as I do this color series here moving forward, I will go over some of these colors again, especially the most popular ones that are in all of your painting sets. Uh, so you can kind of get an idea for whether they're warms or cools and what they mix with really, really well. But as you can see, there are so many different shades of blues from ceruleans to turquoises to phthalos, cobalts, ultramarine, and where do you start? Well, that's why you're going to watch my channel, because that is going to help you a great deal. So whether you use um, Winsor & Newton, uh, Schmincke, I have over here a palette of Roman Schmal. I have so many different paints, as you know. I have like all your favorite palettes and more. So whatever you're using, just look for the pigment information. And that would be like, for instance, Ultramarine. The pigment is PB29. If it has another pigment in it, it's not Ultramarine, even if it's titled that. A lot of, a lot of manufacturers that are not professional watercolor paints will come up with fancy names. And sometimes it's not just PB29, maybe it's PB29 mixed with something else. And that would make a huge difference in your outcome. I mean, first of all, Ultramarine just itself is a gorgeous color. And it's usually, I would recommend everyone have it and make sure that if you're buying a palette that it has it as a basic blue because it's probably the most popular blue ever used, right, in watercolor. And the reason why is because it's so versatile. It has a gorgeous, gorgeous underplay of granulating color to it. And I'm just kind of wetting. This is the Schmincke one. PB29 is a warm blue. It's more on like a purple shade, right? So if you were going to compare it, it's because it's got like a little bit of a tint of red as compared to cobalt. So ultramarine is warm, purpley shade, tints of red. It's granulating. It's semi-staining, so you can kind of lift it, but it's also transparent, which is incredible. Well, semi-transparent, I would say. So we're going to do little like skyscrapers here. And I got a full mass tone of it there. And as I kind of bring it across, I'm going to bring it all the way over here. And then we're going to kind of go up and build little skyscrapers. I love doing this for my mixing charts because it's just something different. And it looks really, really cool when you do it. And then here we're going to add it since I've got it on my brush. I don't want to waste it. I'm going to go ahead and, and do that here and here so that we have this started as well, because these are going to go pretty quick. Add another one. And I'm just using just a flat brush. It makes skyscrapers so much easier, right? A little more color. And that way I haven't really wasted anything. You're going to see all the different shades and everything. So rinse out the brush. Now, if you mix it with different colors, it's going to give you different results. So I highly recommend you just take your ultramarine and do a whole page of mixing and experimenting with your colors. So that way 
you don't waste your time when you go to paint. Let's try magenta, one of my favorite colors, which is PV42. So remember, ultramarine is the ultramarine pigment is PV29. So it's just one pigment. Magenta is PB, PV42. Sorry about that. PV42. So when we grab magenta, always look at the color information. Don't just go by if your uh, company that you're using says that it's magenta. It might not be. You just never know. So it could be a magenta, like a purple magenta or a different kind of magenta but this is this beautiful magenta and it's as you can see I can write I can go over the writing and it's semi staining it's not really it's liftable so now as it starts to mix with our beautiful ultramarine here I'm gonna go up here and make some more buildings and we're gonna start to see those gorgeous colors let me get you in a little closer those gorgeous gorgeous colors There we go. Mix together. I, think I need to move this over a bit. There you go. So see how pretty that is? It's just beautiful. I don't want my light to give you too much light. Let's see how I can adjust this. There we are. Better. So see how it does these mixed with the magenta? It does such beautiful pinks but also really really beautiful clear purples and it's like semi-transparent too so as I'm mixing more with the magenta I get all these gorgeous shades and then pulling it down for a little skyscraper scene here look at those lovely shades now you could just do a whole painting based on that is that just gorgeous or what? Isn't that beautiful? I think that is so pretty. Okay, call me crazy, but my camera was flipped the other way, so I didn't realize you couldn't read the screen <laughs> and all the writing. Look at how gorgeous those shades are. All right, so let's go to the lemon. I'm gonna use lemon for the next one. And lemon uh, is in pretty much I think every everybody's kit and that is a PY3 so make sure if you're using lemon that it says PY3 and it's a beautiful bright color as it mixes in you're gonna get these moody greens and you can almost get like olive greens with it. You know, look at how pretty these greens are. Isn't that gorgeous? So just develop up the buildings. This is a great way to do a painting actually, uh, really easily if you just want to do a skyline in your, in your watercolor journal. And I'm just kind of brushing over these blues, even though they're dry. And it's combining and making these gorgeous different shades. Isn't that just lovely? Look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. My lemon looks a little bit uh, dusty because my brush obviously still had some of the green in it. But we can dry that off. We're never stuck. You're never stuck with watercolor. Always remember that. And there I got back to the beautiful light lemon shade. Isn't that just so pretty? Beautiful, beautiful. Gorgeous. So just with two colors, I mean, do you really need anything else? You can see where you could develop a whole floral painting, everything with just two colors, and then maybe go back and add a third, you know, just for the shadows and the shades. You don't even have to get that complicated. You can just keep it really simple like that, you know? Okay, so the next one, we're going to mix it with a neutral. So the neutral I'm going to choose this time is uh, a Scarlet Lake. You can also use Pyro Scarlet. 
Scarlet Lake is typically PR 188. It's a beautiful bright red orange. I use this a lot actually um, to go over things to add a little punch of color. And this is going to make those moody, moody purples, like really warm, beautiful purples because, um, because the ultramarine is a warm blue, you're going to get warm purples. Unless, of course, you use a cooler shade, which is more of this, and it'll give you another tone. So it won't actually go to neutral. Um, entirely. I find that mixing it with pyro and I have another sample that I can show you that's really interesting. You do get a lot of like those almost like a like Prussian blues to these really interesting darks. I'll bring this over here I mix it with a little bit of white just to show you. I've got some white on my paper here. How pastel -y you can also get if you just add a little bit of white gets very opaque but it's kind of interesting to look at just in case you're like a gouache kind of person cool huh <gasps> I didn't even realize you guys it was off of the screen I am so sorry about that So isn't that beautiful though? It's so pretty. And let me show you another example of this. So here, the pyro scarlet mixed with the ultramarine, it gives you such a beautiful, beautiful blue. It's really, really pretty. You can get like blues to grays. This is giving even just a little more purple, but if I take the ultramarine and Give it some more. There, I have you so close, I didn't even realize that it was off the screen. I'll make up for it though, I promise. So look at how pretty that is. Now we can lift it back to a little bit just by drying off my brush with some clean water. And I'm just gonna peel that back so I can read my writing and just show you how easy it is to to lift ultramarine because it's a semi transparent, but it's also semi staining, meaning that a little bit of that granulation is going to be left, but that makes a really cool, like dusky look. If you just bring it back just a bit, see how dusky it looks. Isn't that cool? And then this is the area where I had some of the red mixed with the white to give you that like lovely pink kind of tone and some peaches and some you know beautiful different moody shades this is really fun to do I really enjoy doing this actually okay so let me move this over all right so let's go to um, cobalt next so cobalt is also a staple in every palette I don't think well, I've seen a lot of palettes without it. I can't say I've seen it in every palette, but I don't know why, because it's considered the primary blue of watercolor and every professional watercolor artist uses cobalt. So when we look at cobalt and we look at the attributes that it has, it is, yeah, it's a, one of the more expensive watercolors and that's maybe why they don't include it in a kit. But at the same time, it's considered a primary that's in between warm and cool. So it's not all the way warm. It's not all the way cool. And what that means to you is it's going to give you, of course, like everything else, different effects depending on what you use it with. So I'm just adding some buildings here, some areas to my drawing. And before it dries, hopefully we'll get it. But even if it does dry, it will still work. Um, you want to look for the genuine cobalt in anything, which is PB28. And remember what I said, like Winsor Newton, 
um, Schminka, Daniel Smith, everybody has one. But remember that you always want to make sure that it is just the single pigment color as anything else. Whenever you have a single pigment color, I feel like you're getting a lot more value for your money. And it's definitely the way to go to have a mixable palette, something that won't confuse you. Convenience colors is what I call mixes, you know, convenience colors are like greens where they're made with yellows and blues. They're not single pigment colors, typically, unless it's uh, Viridian. They're very convenient to use, you know. So this is a alizarin crimson, and it is PR206, one of the staples of my palette always. I absolutely love it. And most professional watercolor artists do because it's a very clear red. Now, as you can tell, when we mix it with this beautiful cobalt, it makes these gorgeous moody purples. And they're just gonna give our building so much shade and shadow from the deep red of the alizarin crimson to the lighter red shade. It's really, really pretty. Let's add a little more of our cobalt. Just so that I have more of these beautiful shades represented. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. And it's got a granulating effect because the blue is granulating. So it adds this gorgeous texture. Look at how pretty that is. Now cobalt is one of the blues that is highly liftable, which is why so many professional artists have this in the palette. And I would never not, like if I'm gonna try out a new watercolor, which I'm getting ready to do by the way, I always, always try a cobalt before anything else because it's so versatile. So with a clean brush, you can, easily lift it and look at how clean that comes back compared to the ultramarine the lifting is so clean and then if you go to the ultramarine and you try to lift it you're going to still get a little bit of a shadowy look in the lift as compared to this very clean lift that you get almost all the way back to the white when you're using cobalt so let me wet this a little bit here because it's dry i can always add more Okay, let's go to the Azo Yellow. Azo Yellow is PY150, one of my favorites on the channel, as you know. I love it because it's got like, when you first lay it down, it has this like golden quality to it that looks so much like um, Quin Gold. But then once you get away from the mass tone, it's got this brightness, almost like a lemon yellow or a Hansa yellow. So what you're going to get when you mix it with blues is really beautiful greens. And they're almost like anywhere from olive greens to light, light yellow greens. And even really moody teals. So if you mix a lot of the blue with it, you can see I'm developing out some really moody kind of green teals, which I would consider to be cobalt, cobalt greens. So um, there are a lot of companies out there that make a cobalt green, and that's basically PB28 mixed with a yellow. And uh, they've sometimes even mixed it with something else, but you can make your own greens. You know, you don't really have to uh, waste any watercolor money on convenient greens, unless you're a watercolor professional or a collector like myself. I mean, some people collect cars, some people collect jewelry. I collect watercolor. <laughs> I just love it though. So look at how pretty that is. Isn't that gorgeous? So very moody cobalt greens. And then moving down, we're going to do a, um, a burnt sienna for you with the cobalt because that is going to give you that incredible neutral. So this is Burnt Sienna PR101. Just 
smooth this over. I need to get a little bit more cobalt on my brush. And you're going to see those gorgeous moody neutrals. Now, depending on how much blue is on your brush versus how much burnt sienna or like orange tone or a warm uh, brown, whatever it is that you're trying, it's going to give you like almost like a navy looking blue. And then if it has a lot of burnt sienna, you're going to get this. Let me rinse my brush out so you can see it better. You're going to get an incredible sh bunch of grays. Now, a lot of, if you've ever watched a professional artist paint, they use cobalt and burnt sienna or raw sienna, something similar, um, all the time. And they don't wash their palettes because the reason why they don't wash their palettes is because this is the be most beautiful set of blues and and uh, and brown shades that are such a great natural watercolor brown. So you'll see these really, really super dirty palettes. And what you're really seeing is just cobalt mixed with burnt sienna. And literally, they'll just do all the painting with that especially like in architectural paintings because they can manufacture these beautiful grays and go, you know, slide between the blues and the, um, the blue grays and the more raw earthy tones. You see how gorgeous that is. I mean, you really don't need to do anything else other than that. If you're doing buildings and architecture, because you can also have that ability to lift it back. Right. So that you can get your lights back in there. And then you've got plenty of warmth, shades and shadows. You know, you've got lots and lots of versatility in this, these two colors alone in a palette. So if you're going to develop maybe a travel palette, this would be excellent. And then throw in a couple of, you know, like a yellow and alizarin crimson, maybe a quin uh, rose or something like that. And what else would you possibly need other than that is gorgeous, right? So you get these deep moody neutrals with the burnt siennas or something like it. Um, you can try this with oranges. You can try this with any of your favorite, like warm kind of earthy tones and see what you get and see if maybe that's where you want to be. You know, if that's it, that's it. Everybody has a different, um, a different palette idea for this. And I can honestly say that every single artist I know has a different way of mixing, of mixing that. Now I just threw on a little bit of ultramarine on here so you can kind of see the shade difference. And also just realize that like, it's something you can use alongside of your cobalt blue because it's in between, right? So if you add a little bit more of the ultramarine, you got that purpley kind of look mixing through for the shades and shadows. Great so far, right? So before we go on, I just want to check in here. Isn't that great? Beautiful. So like what we've learned so far is that starting with a single pigment color and developing through to a a different palette is a wonderful way to go because it makes the ease of painting um, just kind of come forward and you can concentrate on the form and the shape rather than the painting and struggling with your watercolors. Does that make sense? So like if you go with single pigment colors, you're not going to get dirty money mixes because just two colors that are single pigment are going to make a range of colors in between, but they're not going to be muddy because there's nothing in there to make the muddy. Even when you're using burnt sienna, or raw sienna, and I've, even if the burnt sienna has more than one color in it, which a lot of them do. That's just going to give you like all of these different shades of neutrals, right? But still not muddy, not unless you add a third color to this. If you add a third color to us, depending on what it is, that's where the muddiness would come from. Let's look at thalo blue next. Thalo blue is a cool staining blue. It's non-granulating and it's a very, very popular color in a lot of watercolor palettes for that reason. It is bright and bold and vivid and will take over a painting. So be warned, you do not need a lot of that. I actually put a ton on my brush there just so that you can see it will flow 
and it will develop out into these really, really beautiful bright tones. But it's a lot of fun to paint with. I always have a phthalo blue and a phthalo green and even a phthalo turquoise in my palette. I'm going to mix this with Quinn Rose because that's one of my favorite things to mix phthalo with for those really bright, bold color mixes. I'm going to show you why because it's going to give me gorgeous bright purples. This is really fun if you're doing florals because you can mix it with yellow to get really bright greens. You can develop out some beautiful, beautiful purple shades. And even get like those really light, transparent, light pinks to those little violet purples. And for extra fun, if you want to add a little bit of ultramarine to this, it will make it even more moody. So if you wanted to take the same color palette and you wanted to create more shadows, maybe once it's dry as a glaze, or you just wanted to get a little more depth of color, you could add a little bit in your palette of ultramarine to this mix. Now, Thalo Blue comes in several shades. There is a red shade, which is the transparent primary shade of Thalo Blue. And there's the green shade, which is a common blue that a lot of people use. You have to decide if you like the green or the red shade and see what works best for you in your mixes. I recommend that you try them both because it is available in the green shade and the red shade. Those two versions are kind of synonymous, right? You'll see them as PB15 is the phthalo blue shade, but then you'll also see PB15 uh, colon three for the blue shade of phthalo and PB15 colon zero for like maybe the Daniel Smith version or PB15 uh, colon three for a non-granulating transparent green shade. So the red shade, I think, is more PB15. It's like the, the standard. But I have seen the blue shade be marked as PB15 colon 3. So you just want to kind of look and see. Uh, this one that I'm using here is the one by Roman Schmall, which is the red shade of Thalo Blue. I also love the Helio Cerulean in Schmincke and um, the Thalo in Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith also makes a Thalo turquoise that is beautiful. That's um, the shade here, Thalo turquoise. Thalo green deep is also a Thalo that's gorgeous, Thalo green light. So there's a lot that I have in my palettes. I love Thalos. Thalos is a great, it's, it's non-granulating, right? So it's a great way to brighten up things. Like I have in this palette, I have Thalo turquoise, ultra turquoise which is really bright and then here I have the helio turquoise helio cerulean is very simple to similar to the phthalo as well it works pretty much the same way but just gorgeous just gorgeous all right let's mix this with cad yellow so cad yellow is kind of like a really really bright beautiful warm warm yellow and I feel like it mixes with phthalo really really in an interesting way. I can get really fun greens from it, even like almost green golds, you know, just by taking a little bit of phthalo and moving it. I can use it for shadows and get like that dusty with the CAD. I can get almost like a dusty look. And then, um, Mix it here for a brighter, darker green. See those lush greens? So those are great for foliage on trees to add that brightness. So say you have a lot of uh, like kind of moody greens and you want like a really bright green, you can go from even like this, this phthalo blue will make like this beautiful shade of phthalo turquoise when you add 
the cad yellow or or hansa will work as well hansa yellow lemon yellow works great too so if you have ye lemon yellow you know don't be limited just get whatever colors you have out and if they are sig single pigment now if your company that you're using does not tell you what pigment <laughs> is in them you're in trouble because that's probably there's a reason why I don't think I've ever had any company that doesn't mark it on the tubes or t like have it on the label or at least on the website so you should always always be able to access the pigment information and if you can't then just switch your watercolors if it's giving you a hard time because it's probably so chucked full of fillers that it literally won't give you anything else now look at that see all the different tones the depths the beautiful light light bright green so it's almost like a phthalo green right so i've made phthalo green so look at all the different shades like phthalo green you can make if i keep working with it i can make almost like a hooker's green in the center there so you're not really stuck right because you've got all these beautiful greens from brights to dark greens depending on how much thalo you add and then of course you could always take your cobalt and mix it in you can take your ultramarine and mix it in and, and get something else and you know it's highly staining so i'm not going to lie it's not going to be the easiest thing to lift but it is possible with a synthetic brush and some water to lift it back a bit so even though i have it in mass tone here you can see i can add some water and I can still get some light back into it and bring it back to like that transparent state that it naturally has. It's just a very staining blue. So you want to work with it with that in mind. I find that it glazes really well. So it, rather than lay it down really thick all at once, you could lay it down um, in thinner gonna peel some of this back so you can see how it works with water even after it's dry lots of options though right there we go so I'm just kind of creating more layers in my little city here just by taking a wet brush okay now let's do uh, this one it's pretty fun so I'm just gonna re-wet see I can re-wet very easily even when it's dry and we're gonna take a really bright um, pyro red this is the pyro red so you could also use a, a bright red pyro red what else is there there's scarlet there's trying to think of other colors that are similar to this maybe like a Windsor red if you're um, if you like Windsor Newton now this is going to make really beautiful wine tones so if you love wine tones like if you're doing florals and you want that moody kind of look in your florals you don't want things to be too bright or if you're doing a gorgeous city you know um, maybe a city that's like like France you know like French city and you want it to just have those beautiful moody blues you wouldn't think that you would get this much moodiness from a phthalo but yes depending on what you mix it with your red or your pink is going to give you something different and just keep working with it and I'm just working it in with my brush if I run out of water I can always you know just kind of pushing it around I'm going down here now let's clean up the writing so I can see my writing lift that there I can lift that back a bit let's lift it here Lift it there. Then just blend this down a bit here. And I'm just working what I call working the watercolor. 
while it's while it's damp I'm adding a clean damp brush and I'm pushing it in different ways to shape the form. It's a more advanced method. I don't teach this in my um, beginners classes because it can be a little bit uh, difficult and it can really mess up a painting if you are not used to it. You have to practice, you know. So I try to teach like really easy, you know, paint paint right away and end up with something really good. <laughs> this one takes a little bit of practice, but you'll get the hang of it. You know, you should know about every technique in watercolor because that's what's so fun about watercolor. So see how I'm actually able to lift to get another different shade here. And it just looks so, so pretty. Isn't that beautiful? All right, there we are. So I now have showed you how to work with the ultramarine, the cobalt, and the phthalo blue mixed with cad yellow, quin rose, pyro red, or a bright red, a sienna, whether it be burnt sienna, raw sienna, cobalt green making from azo yellow, a lizard crimson, magenta, lemon yellow, and scarlet lake. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, be sure to subscribe because I'll be back with more color mixing videos. If you like the color mixing series, I for sure would love to see you guys using my affiliate links below because it helps out the channel and it supplies me with tons of colors so that when you suggest them in the group page, I can actually go buy them. Also, when I have extra, I always send out gift packages to my group members who are the most active members and people that join my watercolor classes. So that all keeps everything going and I appreciate you guys. I hope you liked the video. I'll talk to you later. Happy painting.